Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the uh, G3X. Uh, uh, my colleagues earlier this week have been talking about GTN. Uh, my colleague Katie's been working with the installation side uh, and getting everything up to speed on G3X. But now we're going to focus in on the pilot side. Uh, today we're going to be a basic introduction going over uh, you know, PFDs, MFDs, and a lot of the configurable options that the G3X platform has, especially in comparison to some other Garmin platforms out there. Very customizable system. Really, really like the G3X. Uh, my name is Matt Clark. I am an aviation pilot trainer here at Garmin. Been with Garmin now for five years, uh, both with our aviation product support team, as well as obviously the for the, probably the last three and a half years with the aviation training team. And we teach everything from GTNs, the flight displays, uh, G3, G1, 2, 3, 5,000, but we also to cover the, the G3X system here. Uh, so we're going to kind of do a deep dive here. I'm not going to be able to cover everything that G3X could do, but I'm going to cover the, the big ticket items for that. If I were to cover everything the system can do, I'd be here for days. So it's it's definitely a, a very versatile and capable system and customizable to the way you want to fly and how you're comfortable flying. So uh, bear in mind, you know, I yes, I am a CFII, yes, I am a trainer for Garmin, but we're not here teaching how to use the air, uh, teaching how to fly the aircraft. We're teaching and showing you how you can use the avionics and get the best out of them there. So basic overview of today. Well, we're going to start in with a, a basic system overview, going in through the primary flight display, going through some overview as well as some setup options we have and some shortcut items. Uh, that'll make your flying a little bit more enjoyable or if you need to modify anything around of how we can do that very quickly and very easily. And we'll do a, a pretty deep dive into the MFD or multifunction display starting with page navigation, how we can navigate both using touch screens as well as some of the dual concentric knobs, uh, going into some MFD setup through different setup on different pages, and, and once again, how do we get the most out of the platform, and based on that particular flight, based on what's going to be the most critical, what information do I want to see, what information do I not want to see, as well as going into some of the functionality of the system and, and different pages in there as well. And then we'll end it with some basic navigation, uh, how we can use G3X if it's if it's in its standalone VFR state uh, from direct to and some flight planning and, and have some, some of that interaction there, as well as what interacts. And that's some limited interaction if we have an external navigator, such as a, a GNS, a GTN, or one of our uh, GPS series, the GPS 175, 355, 375 series navigators, and differences that you would see between the two there. So as we're going through this today, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to email us here at aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com. That comes directly to the training team. Uh, me and my colleague Paul will be the ones that will I'll be answering any of those questions that you have. Uh, if you do have more specific installation questions or troubleshooting questions, then I would uh, recommend reaching out to g3expert at garmin.com. That goes to our, our uh, support team and very, very knowledgeable individuals over there as well. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump on in. We've got a lot of good stuff that we're going to cover today. So we're going to start with the overview here of our primary flight display or PFD. So when we look at our PFD, if you're used to flying any other Garmin panel, the G3X is going to feel very, very similar. We keep a very similar flow, very similar format uh, in comparison to all of our other panels. Uh, whether you're looking at TXI, a G1000, if you're comfortable with one, for the most part, you're comfortable with all of them. There's always going to be a few minor differences here and there, but it's pretty consistent layout. Starting with our tapes, uh, standard glass panel for us, we are going to run airspeed and altitude tapes. Airspeed's on the left, following uh, your traditional six-pack. Airspeed indicator is usually up on the upper left. Our airspeed tape here is in the same. In the very center, you're going to have your attitude indicator. And you can really see, in this case, with the synthetic vision running, the entire display becomes an attitude indicator for you. Uh, you'll have the attitude indicator bars, the, the pitch scale up there. Uh, at the top is uh, 
where we have our standard rate turn indicators. These are very, very useful. Uh, for those that are flying G5s, you see a very similar, or TXI, you see these very similar indicators. And those are the green icons that were shown on either side of your, or on the uh, roll tape there. And here we kind of see a little bit bigger, a little more blown up uh, picture of that. Uh, down below is your slip skid indicator. So this is one difference compared to our certified equipment now. I know there is G3X that is certified, but compared to say uh, G1000 or TXI or G500, G600, normally at the roll indicator at the top is where you see that slip skid. In the case of the G3X, we actually have the, the separate ball down at the bottom there above the HSI. On the left-hand side uh, is our altitude tape and vertical speed indicator. You can see we've got the barrow setting down below, altitude up at the top, and on to the right-hand side of that itself is the vertical speed. A nice thing with this panel, any of these options, uh, say for instance the, use my razor pointer, we have the altitude, the altitude selector or altitude in, altitude box, or our barrow, uh, barrow box, these are boxes, these are cyan. Following our standard Garmin logic, if I see it in a box and I see it as cyan, that means I can go on and I can make a change. And specifically with the touch screen, I can press on those individual boxes and then bring up a keypad and I can input directly through a keypad or through the touch screen. That being said, I also have options with our knobs down in the corner. So in this case, uh, my lower left hand one, my outer knob is set to an altitude selector. My right knob right now is set to a barrow. So I can use the knob, big knob to change my barrow settings. So you've got redundancy. If one works, the other, or if one method isn't working, then we have another method. If you're getting knocked around to turbulence, we can grab the knobs and still accomplish what we need to accomplish. Down at the bottom is our HSI, and if you're flown with any Garmin HSI, this is going to feel really familiar as well. We follow the same thing. Major tick marks as appropriate. You're going to see a number of different things on there. We'll get some better close-up pictures here in just a little bit of the, what the HSI is going to look like. But we can see already just looking at this screen, we've got the, your... Uh, your service level, so here we're flying GPS. I can see my CDI scaling, so we know well, full scale deflection right now is uh, 1.25 nautical miles. If you have an external navigator, that then that enunciation is going to change based on your CDI scaling, based on where you are uh, along your flight plan, whether it's an en route, a terminal, uh, an LNAV, LPV, anything like that. Uh, so it'll match up to what we see off of our external navigator. At the very top, we also have another rate of turn indicator. So we mentioned the two green triangles at the top of the attitude. We also see the rate of turn here. So that magenta bar right above your HSI itself. So one line over, following standard logic here, is half scale or half standard, uh, standard rate turn. Second line, second white line is a full scale or a full standard rate turn excuse me in this case here if we're turning we are flying a standard rate turn and then if i go anything beyond i'll see that magenta line go beyond that second line meaning i'm going more than a standard rate turn so we're building in a little bit of a cross check right off between the attitude indicator and the hsi Everything else, uh, we have bearing pointers. Those are those blue icons on there. I've got uh, two from indicators. It follows a standard HSI for us. Keeps that very, very simple. One thing I do like to notice, there is some additional enunciations that G3X is going to show us. So as we mentioned, you have your heading knob, you have your heading bug up here in the blue. We have the, you can change the heading with either a knob in the corner or by selecting that box and typing in, um, I can. It's going to show me what the desire or what the uh, course is right now. It's showing 029, which matches up to what I see on the course pointer on our HSI itself. As we said, there's our G, there's our service level. So if we are flying um, 
No. Magenta needles are flying GPS course guidance. If you changed your source over to green needles, then you would show either VOR or localizer, whatever you happen to be tracking your CDI scaling. And then down in the corner, we do have the additional, or the bottom, uh, bottom left, some additional enunciations. And you can see a number of ones. In this case, right now, we're showing a reversion, but you could show VFR, uh, reversion or uh, internal or INT. So VFR means we have manually selected to use the G3X's internal VFR GPS. If you're always flying, if you don't have an external nav, then you should be expecting to see VFR. Uh, but if you do, are you if you are running an external navigation source, then if you see VFR, then bear in mind your your HSI is not talking to your external nav. So that's a good little double check for us. If you see it go into a reversionary mode like we're seeing here, that means something downgraded. Something has, we, we don't have uh, what we need from the external navigator and it's reverting back to the internal nav. And then the internal INT there is what we're showing. If we're really, if we're truly selecting the internal nav from, from our G3X, we are running off internal nav versus an external nav source. So a couple different enunciations depending on uh, if we have any faults or depending on how what we're communicating with at that time. Going back to the big picture here, at the very top are your AFCS enunciations. Uh, if anybody has seen our GFC 500 uh, presentation, then there are some G3 references in there. We do differentiate just a little bit or change a couple of items of the order they appear uh, compared to a lot of the other airframes. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on that today. I do have another webinar coming up where we're going to be talking about the G3X autopilot and that's where we're going to talk more about that. But this is a standard feature. This is what you will see at the top of your uh, primary flight display. Now, the G3X itself is highly, highly customizable. There's a lot of different things that we can do with this uh, system. And a lot of it's gonna based, uh, be based on what we have interfaced in. Uh, if I go back a previous slide, I can see I've got uh, COM1 interfaced in and I've got options to control the radio from the display. I've got an audio panel wired into and interfaced to, to, to the display. And I've got a transponder controlled, and then there's some other configurable options there. It's all going to depend on what I have interfaced. I even have my COM2 controls up here. So multiple COMs, transponders, audio panels, all that can be controlled from the display, but it all depends on how it's interfaced and how it's interconnected. If I don't have any of that, then I can see up at the top here, it's simply a row of customizable options, and we'll get into that of how we can change those. So very configurable. So the first way uh, we're going to work with uh, PFD options, there's multiple ways to get there. First, I can press on the menu button that's directly on the D G3X display. This is going to work when we're at a full screen primary flight display. If I'm split screened at all and I hit the menu button, now we're going to be interacting with the menu for that split screen page, that MFD page. So one way to do that is here, if we hit menu, which will bring up our PFD options. Another way to get to this is actually pressing anywhere on the HSI itself. That is itself a shortcut to our PFD options. So if we are split screened, I have the MFD up, and I need to change something on my primary flight display, then I'm going to go ahead and just press on the HSI, and we're going to come back to the same PFD options window. From here, we have a ton of different options. Uh, first two that I like to point out and are a great feature are our inset windows. We have two different insets that we can op or we can interface with. Um, a standard option that I like to fly with is keeping my map on the left hand side and on the lower left side and my flight plan on the lower right. That's the way I, f I fly a lot of G1000, and that's the way I pull my MF, or that's the way I pull my primary flight display up. So when I go to a G3X, just as a consistency sake, I like to keep it the same, but these are customizable. What do you want, and what are gonna be the most viable for that flight? So for instance, if I, 
click on the left one there, I have the options for the map. I can go to a nearest airport if I'm VFR and I'm not worried about the flight plan so much or if I'm just direct to somewhere, then a nearest airport can be a very valuable option for us. If we have video inputs feeding in, maybe I'm having a dedicated G meter if I have the appropriate equipment interfaced in. And so customize either side as appropriate. The next option we have are bearing pointers. Now, a lot of the uh, bigger panels, TXI, G1000, 35000, when we turn a bearing pointer on, we're either referencing off GPS or referencing off of a VOR or ground-based nav source of some sort. G3X gives us a few more options. Uh, so one, I can still do a bearing pointer for uh, a GPS or a, a VOR or whatever ground-based nav I have selected, but another great option, and this is one I like quite a bit, is for a nearest airport. And this is one to kind of keep in mind. I can set bearing two to nearest, and when I look down here, it's, I see the double line for that bearing pointer, but it's telling me the airport and it's telling me the distance. And when I look on my HSI, I can see the double line. I know where that nearest airport is. I don't have to look anywhere else. I don't need to turn anything else on. I know where I should point the aircraft if I need to divert anywhere. That is a fantastic option for the G3X system. Now these are some basic options here. Others, if you're doing uh, a timer option, we can pull a timer from here. That being said, another quick way to get to that flight timer is simply pressing the timer that we see on the PFD right on this bottom bar. Both are gonna do the same thing for us. Uh, if we are flying approach minimums, this is also where we're gonna go in and set that minimum for the approach. So press the HSI, go to minimums, and off you go. But for any additional PFD options that we want to change, this is kind of big, high level, big, massive changes that we're making to the display. If we want to have more in-depth changes, then we can go into the more options that we've got highlighted. Now, we can also go into the main menu, into system, into primary flight display to get to this PFD setup. But this is, I think, a little bit faster. Go to the HSI go to your mat or more options, and now we can change everything else. And this is where we can change anything from our presentation on the PFD, wind vectors, uh, do we want to show those rate of point, rate, uh, rate of turn indicators, those two green icons up at the top or not, some more customizable options. We can even change what the knobs do in each corner, down here at the right side knob, left side knob action. So customize it the way you want to fly it. Lots and lots of great options for us. And we can see as we scroll down even further, uh, for the lateral deviation, we can see just our standard CDI up there. Uh, we have different synthetic vision options. We can turn synthetic vision on and off, uh, airport signs, flight path markers, or pathways options. A lot of different options that we see in there. The other option, as we mentioned, is going into the main menu, hit the menu button twice. We'll go over to our setup. And from there, our PFD setup takes us back to the same display setup here. Now, this uh, actually, me, this display setup does have a couple other options, such as backlight intensity. Uh, if we want, uh, which side do we want the PFD to split screen to? The right side, the left side. Do we want a wide format, narrower format? So there's some even more additional options that we can customize. Once again, all going back to how you want to fly and how you want your aircraft set up. Now, going back to where uh, some of these customizable options here, those are the inset windows. We said these are customizable. These are also, as we get into the split screen, also shortcuts to those dedicated pages. So if I need to get to a map page, all I need to do is press on the map. Same thing for the flight plan. If I want to get to my flight plan page with the inset pulled up, all I need to do is press anywhere in the flight plan, and that page will be brought up. So great customizable options. 
Uh, we saw before there is a wind vector. There's several different formats. So I'd play around with uh, the variant. Some will show crosswind and headwind components. This is showing you the, uh, the, the arrow, the numerical value, as well as the actual velocity of, the, of that wind. As we mentioned before, the data bar at the top of the display is customizable. So whatever information we want to see, whatever information, whatever equipment we have interfaced in there, we can change that as need be. We have that course deviation indicator right in the center of the display. This is an option we can have turned on or turned off. So if we're flying with just the HSI, we may not need it, but it's also an additional guidance if we need it as well. And then a fun one is actually changing the PFD appearance itself. So I fly a lot of aircraft that fly with tapes. I'm flying our other systems such as our G5, this G, uh, GFC, or G500, 600, TXI, G1000. It's all tape. But if you're the first time coming over and you're used to steam gauges, you're not quite comfortable with tapes, one option is we can set all of our gauges to round dials. So that's a little bit more familiar to what we're used to. So now we have synthetic vision plus our round dials. We can still fly the aircraft perfectly fine. If I don't want synthetic vision at all, I can also turn that off, in which case we still see all the round dials. So you could almost think of this as a stepping stone. If you're getting the, behind the aircraft for the first time, you've never flown behind any glass panel, then we can set the setup that you see here. Once we get comfortable with this, then we can throw in the synthetic vision. Once we get comfortable with the, the synthetic vision display and we want to try tapes, then we can change it back to the standard default layout here. All of it different options, all of it customizable based on what you want, based on how you want to fly the airplane. All right, now we're going to jump through a little bit of MFD, the multifunction display. So first and foremost, number of different ways that we can get to the split screen. The first and probably the easiest here is we hit the select or the split screen icon in the corner. You hit the split, that's automatically going to bring up your split screen and pull up the uh, multifunction display for you. Great option for us. Um, the other options, as we mentioned before, I'm going to go back for a slide, is our inset windows. So here I've got a map. If I want to go to the moving map page, all I need to do is press anywhere in here, and that'll instantly take me to that map page. Same thing would apply. If I had a nearest uh, in one of the as one of the incepts that bring me to the nearest airport page, uh, I typically fly with my flight plan up. So that's one button press to the flight plan page. All different options. Uh, and last one, if I'm having a hard time bracing my hand on the screen, if I press and hold the back button, that will automatically bring that sp uh, split screen up for me as well. So multiple ways to do it. Is there a right way or a wrong way? No. I would say base it on where you are in flight. If you're getting, uh, if you're experiencing a lot of turbulence, maybe pressing and holding the back button is going to be faster for you. Uh, if you need quick reference to uh, a flight plan and nearest or one of those other pages, the inset could work, or simply press the split screen in the corner. So play around, figure out which method you like best, and that's going to be the correct method for you. Now, actually navigating page to page can be done a couple different ways as well. Uh, the first we're going to talk about is the touch screen. So if I press on the actual bar with all the way, all these different chapters label listed, what will happen is it brings up a select page option. So I can jump from page to page very quickly. Tap and press on the bar, and then press whichever page I want to go to. The other option is the dual concentric knob in the corner. And when we start looking at the dual concentric knobs, I want you to pay attention to what you see in the corner of each one. So for instance here, the left-hand knob is controlling my heading and my altitude. So that's good to know. Versus the one on the right right now, the inner knob is a zoom, so I can zoom in, zoom out using the knob, or the outer knob is going to change the page. So there's some fairly standard options here, but it's going to change based on what page we have up. So pay attention to what you see down in the corners.
and there we go. We've changed them. We're using the big knob, we're rotating around, and we can see the inner knob function is changing from page to page based on what page we happen to be on. So now we're going to go into a little bit of map setup. Now, there's a lot of different options that we have for setup up, setting up the map. Um, and I recommend taking some time, figuring out what features, what things you like to see, what things you don't like to see. So we're going to start off with, you have split screen pulled up. As we said, when we hit menu, that's going to pull up the map options or the options for whatever page we have pulled up. First thing you're going to see here is a number of overlays, starting from a profile view. We can show weather. Do we want a VFR, IFR map, terrain, some basic views here. We also have that option to declutter the map if need be. But up at the top here is the set up map option. That's where we can actually start diving in and going into a little bit more detail. A couple things to kind of highlight here, um, we do have, we'll, we'll go through a few on each page here. In the general section, so I can use my finger and slide across, we have auto zoom, meaning it's going to zoom in, zoom out based on your position to, uh, or your distance to that next fix in the flight plan. Uh, your orientation, whether you like to fly north up, track up, heading up, all based on what you like to see and what you like to fly. We also have the orientation up in the corner. So if I press that option, the north up indicator, that will also change that map between north up to whatever I had else selected. So track up or heading up. So some quick ways that I can go back and forth on those. Great little feature in there. You can see we've selected the icon. We're back up into a north up mode. Going up, there's our map type between VFR versus IFR. IFR is showing the little bit more of that green, standard what we see topo. IFR, we're just showing the white background. Like we're similar to the in route charts, but this is all still a Garmin chart. This is not a, an, an actual in route chart yet. You have topo shading, uh, terrain shading. You can have those on, those off, depending on what you need. I fly around in Kansas, Missouri. It's pretty flat around here, so I don't typically fly with the terrain on, but it is an option for us. And some other obstacles, some uh, some obstacles and the inner, the selected altitude range arc. So if here, if we turn the uh, obstacles on, I can see there's yellow, there's red obstacles on the map. These are options I can turn on, turn off. And then what I like is the that uh, blue line that I'm highlighting there, the selected altitude intercept arc. Or the, um, this is an arc of whatever altitude I have set as my selector. If I'm climbing, I'm descending that's where we're going to intercept that altitude at. So very useful for climbs, very useful for descents, uh, crossing restrictions, very quick, useful piece of information. Other information under that line group we have is for track log. So you'll see a kind of a breadcrumb track as you're flying along. They kind of keep a reference of where we've been, where we are. Uh, you can change that color as need be. Another one I like is the track vector. So right here we see in front of the aircraft, we can set that to a distance or a time. And as we're flying along, I prefer, per, uh, personally like flying with a time. So at the end of that line or at the end of that track vector, I know where the aircraft is going to be in the in X amount of time. But same thing would be distance. If I had it set as a 10 mile, whatever is at the end of that line, we're 10 miles out from that point. So some, some great customizable options for you. Here we have the airport section where we can change. We have large airports, medium airports, small airports. Typically, you're going to see these set as auto. So as you zoom in, zoom out on the map, some of the stuff will come on, come off the map. Um, but just based on what you want to see, where we are. You have runway extensions, excuse me, uh, as you have a, if you have a airport in your flight plan, then it will show those, and you can kind of see them on here, these green lines extending out from the airport. Those are just runway extension lines, giving you a little bit more situational awareness, dialing into that specific airport and then to that specific runway. 
And then we can also have Safe Taxi. If we have Safe Taxi on, when I zoom in far enough on the map, it'll show my aircraft position on the ramp, wherever I happen to be, as well as the taxiways, the runways. Um, very useful tool for maintaining proper situational awareness. Now, this isn't going to replicate or uh, replace the need to look out and see where we are, see what taxiway we're on, but this is, can definitely aid in determining where we are and where we should be going. Uh, the nav aid group, just what nav aids you want to see, NDBs, VORs, size of the text, and when they're going to show, when they're not going to show. Once again, the standard option is to have it set as an auto, so it can automatically come on, automatically come off, but you can customize that based on what you fly. Same thing there with the label and the text size. Uh, the airspace, we have the, uh, obviously, what airports, uh, smart We've got altitude labels if you want to see where the altitudes are for that particular airspace shelf. Uh, smart airspace itself can be kind of a useful one. Based on your altitude, the lines will either, or the airspace will either kind of go a, a, a subdued grade or it'll show the proper color as showing you are you going to intercept that altitude or not. And as we can see here, it's kind of based on your altitude. As I come in, I'm low level. We're at 1,800 feet right here. It's a little faint to see on the screen, but that is the outer shelf of the Kansas City Class Bravo. Now, that shelf in this particular area starts at 4,000 feet. Well, we're plenty far away from it, so it's subdued. So I know I'm not going to interfere or interact with that particular airspace or that, that shelf of the airspace versus if there's a lower shelf here or this very inner one that goes all the way to the surface. I can see those blue lines, they're a lot clearer. So it's a way to help declutter based on your altitude. And that's probably a better picture here. The outer shelves, they're subdued, meaning I'm not gonna interface or interact with that particular airspace, but the inner shelves are. And then weather. Weather is obviously going to depend on what you have. If you're just running ADSB in, then you're going to have the options for just FISB weather. If you have this FISB and NEXRED, or FISB and SiriusXM, you can change what weather source you have. All depends on what you have and what you want to turn on, what you want to turn off. Continuing on cities, you can show some, some enhanced city information. Uh, the same thing with text what level of detail. Nice thing with the map on the G3X, I can press on that map, and if there's any big point of interest, so for instance here, there's a power plane advisory, and a little bit more information about it. In this case, it happens to be a TFR, but there's a power plant there. We can start pulling more information about that. So, some, some nice options here, especially for flying VFR. We can also see the other. These will be such as neighborhood, geographical features, uh, anything crazy like here, the Shoreline Park, South uh, Pensacola Stadium. So there's a couple different options. We can also show the contour lines and the lat long. Um, we can even show our field of view. So these two lines that are extending out, these are the field of view. This is the, what's in those two lines is what's going to appear on my primary flight display. So having a better sense of what am I seeing on the PFD, well now I know comparing it to the MFD. And then for the rest of the map, we can start pressing, and if we can find out some fun, or some additional functionality here, we can tap on the map, tap on airports, airspace, and get more information. So for instance, here, we selected the Portland Class Charlie airspace, and as I come down, if I look down at the bottom, it says airspace information for Portland. When I press on that option, then it'll take me over and we can get more information about it. Same thing, if I start pressing and or using the arrow buttons on the left and right, then I can start figuring out more, more specific info. Here, this is actually, it's even highlighting an intersection for us. So, some great options. Here we have, we can, if we go one big knob over, we go to our, our sectional. So we can show a VFR sectional, we can show our IFR low, IFR high, and root charts. These are just the digital copies of those, uh, those charts. 
So we can have those built into the display themselves. If we go in, we can actually even graphically edit, which is kind of nice. Uh, if you hit menu, graphically edit, go in and start building flight plans directly off the map. If you're going to a point that's not there, then it'll even ask you, do you want to create a user waypoint? So we can build flight plans even without having something specific there to work our flight plan around. If it's a fix that's in the database, you tap on it, and then, or especially in the case if there's multiple, you select the one you want, and that'll be added into the flight plan as well. And then even the drag and drop. So I can take a fit, take my route, you can rubber band it down to another point that you're seeing on the map. This is very much like we'd see on the GTN series navigators or the uh, GPS, you know, the 175, 355, 375 series. Very, very similar interaction there. Uh, if we do on the map select our uh, a waypoint, this can take us over to the waypoint information page. Or if I take my big knob, roll it over to waypoint, now I can start getting information, whether it's a VOR, an NDB, an airport, and start getting more valuable info. In this case, we, we have K is CZK, Cascade Lock State, as our airport, as our destination. So that's what automatically pulled up. But I see the cyan. I can always uh, press on this box at the top type in the fix or VOR or waypoint I want to get information about and quickly get that information. On the right hand side is where we can start seeing all the additional. So we have just basic information, uh, in this case, you know, uh, altitudes, lat longs, basic info there. We can go down to frequencies, we can go down, here's our Air, AOPA airport directory. Whatever information we want, we can get through this airport. Another one I use considerably is the weather, so we can get METARs, TAFs, anything that'll be a valuable value for that particular airfield. Even here in the AOPA directory, what restaurants are nearby, which is kind of nice. Said we can pull them up on the map. So if I press on them that waypoint on the map, go down, and press the airport info at the bottom. It's taking me once again back to the airport information page. Same thing can happen from the flight plan. If I'm at the flight plan itself, I can tap on the waypoint I want to get information about and go from there. Now, I will specify when we're in the flight plan page here, we can add waypoints. We see it down here. I can add them. I can remove them. All the same interaction I would expect to see. Uh, the restriction is going to start coming into to IFR procedures. I'm not going to be able to load a departure or an arrival procedure because those are instrument procedures. Uh, you will see I can load approaches, but those are from the final approach fix to the missed approach point only. It's not doing the entire route of flight. If you're going to be flying IFR, then you'll need to have an external navigator of some sort as your, as your IFR proved source. Uh, continuing on through our functionality, we do have a dedicated weather page. So if I keep that big knob rolling over, and this is where we can view individual items. So here we have next red pulled up. If I want cloud tops, winds aloft, temps, lightning, whatever I want to see, I can simply start pressing on the icons here. And I have a green down arrow, so I know there's more weather products that I can go view. We can change around. So as we scroll down a little bit, there's METARs, AIRMETs, SIGMETs, and these are also interrogatable. So there's convected SIGMET 13C. I can press anywhere on that SIGMET, and I can even press down here, get more information about that particular SIGMET as appropriate. And here we are. There's the full text for that SIGMET. So here, Still moving from 230 at 25 knots, tops above, flight level 450, hail, wind gust, valuable information that we can get in flight. We can go over to our terrain page and even throw up. So this is showing, uh, it's not taking the, the topographical information not like we're seeing off the map page, it's just showing whether we're above or below, where we are in reference to terrain and then we also have the profile view to show here's our current aircraft and there's any terrain that could affect us for that route of flight. 
following our standard fixed wing layout. Uh, if you see yellow on there, you're between uh, 100 to 1,000 feet above. If you see red, we're within 100 feet or potentially the trains above you. So standard, standard scheme that we're seeing. All right, last little bit we have, we're going to talk a little bit about navigating with G3X. And we're going to start. So we're using the internal GPS in this case. Um, these are, they can be waypoints pulled from the nav database or they can be user waypoints, custom waypoints that you've created. Now we're not going to be able to load airways, we're not loading instrument procedures such as departures and arrivals. As we did mention before, you can load instrument procedures, but it's only the final approach fix through the Mr. Approach point. It's not the legal, the G3X by itself is not a legal IFR navigator. You have to have another source if you're going to be flying IFR. But you can have it give you a little bit of extra situational awareness. So that's where we go in menu. You go to select your approach, and this is where we have it. Still the same options. We have the option to load an approach, activate it. We can go activate vectors to final. But notice the waypoint sequence, just final approach fix to the missed approach point. That's it. So it's real, real basic. And here we can even load it in, or in this case, load and activate. We're direct to the final approach fix. There's the missed approach point. We even see it listed out. There's FA for final approach, MA, missed approach. Now, we can use VNAV to get ourselves down. We're going to talk more about that uh, tomorrow with our G3X autopilot webinar. But we can pull up our AFCS controls. We can create a VNAV profile and let the system fly us down. And you can even see, uh, pretty much by the time you get to the final approach fix, you'll want to be some sort of hand flying or uh, however we need to navigate ourselves down. Now, if you are running an external navigator source, we can go in and change what source. And even on the flight plan page, we can actually show Right now we're running an external GPS. When we're running an external GPS, we're not going to be able to interface as well or interact with the flight plan like we did running internal. So if I want to change that nav source, or if I need to change anything in the flight plan, I then going to need to do it on my external navigator, such as the GTN or GNS. But we can still view all those waypoints in the flight plan. So in this case here, this is coming from our GTN. So we have an approach loaded. In this case, goalie is an initial approach fix. There's jitter, so on and so forth. If I look at my flight plan page, now it's showing me all those extra waypoints. But bear in mind, we are running an external navigator at this point. If you throw it airways, it doesn't necessarily show that individual airway. So on the GTN, it's showing Victor 44 versus on G3X, all it's going to do is show you the individual waypoints. So some minor differences there. Uh, if you load a hold, it will show that there is a hold loaded in the flight plan. But if you're creating it, modifying, doing anything with that hold, you'll need to do that with the external navigator, your GTN or GPS series. Now, if we're on an internal, we can select a waypoint. We can insert before, insert after. If it's an airport, select an approach, remove an approach. Some very similar items that we're used to seeing off some of the externals. Now, if we are running the external nav source, however, we mentioned you can't add, you can't delete, you can't really do a whole lot with the flight plan. But what we can do is still get information. So when I press on a waypoint, the insert before, the after, the remove, all of these options are grayed out. But the waypoint info is still an option for me. So I can select waypoint info and get information about that. So if it's an airport and I'm trying to find what their, their weather is, I can still do that off the G3X page. Everything else flight plan wise for your man, flight plan management will still need to be done off the external nav source. So a couple of differences there. All right. Well, that's going to bring me up to about all I have for you today. I know that was kind of a quick, uh, quick overview of everything G3X can do. There's a whole lot more in there, so I definitely encourage you to dive in, do a deep dive, and explore all the different settings to truly really customize the aircraft and the panel to the way you want to see it.
Uh, so if you've liked what you've seen today and you want more training from us here, please visit us, visit us at flygarmin.com slash training. And here we have uh, instructor-led uh, instructor training. We have e-learning courses for like GTN and uh, some of the G1000. We can also create custom courses. Uh, part of our instructor-led course, um, we are switching over to more of a virtual class, uh, but the in-person classes we do offer some G3X as well. And then you always have uh, Garmin Aviation's YouTube site where you'll see different uh, recorded webinars and, and other useful stuff on there on varying systems. So take a look at any of those, and we look forward to seeing you there. But please explore, once again, flygarmin.com slash training. If you do have any questions or anything specific, please email us here at aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com. We'll be more than glad to talk and answer any questions you may have. Uh, if it is something more tech-specific or install-specific, then I'd recommend reaching out to our uh, G3 expert team at g3expert at garmin.com. They're very, very knowledgeable individuals over there. But I want to thank you, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, everyone, have a wonderful day and safe flying.